And next presentation will be by Andy, and it's about Snap Toolkit. Right. Hi, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with y'all. This is a talk about um, open source software and data planes specifically. I know we've seen a lot of uh, discussion in the, in, in the conference about uh, open source, especially as it relates to uh, configuration. But I'm, I'm going to focus a bit more in this talk about processing packets. And uh, let's have a little bit of fun. I'd like to start my talks with a, a bit of a uh, kind of take the feel of the room. Uh, I guess everybody here is using open source, of course. Um, how many of y'all are have network functions running in your network uh, written in software? Yes, I have a few. Oh, this is great. So y'all are processing packets in software. I guess um, Linux kernel processing packets, yes. User space, data planes, anybody? Oh, we have a few. This is great. This is going to be a great, great time. OK, um, so this talk is about SNAB. Uh, we'll go a bit about why it is that SNAB was made uh, and, and what are the parts inside it. Uh, I feel like it's important to discuss uh, the composition of these things so we can really understand them. And then we'll go from that and say, what are, what are the pieces? What can we combine together? What can, what can we do with it? Um, and there's going to be a little bit of code. So if that's not your thing, uh, <laughs> exit's right there. So right. Um, have you ever had the issue, like you have some, you've heard about something. Maybe it's in an internet draft. Maybe it's in a fresh RFC. It's some sort of architecture you'd like to deploy. But you can't actually, you call up your vendor and they're, you know, you're not really getting any, any, um, any engagement there, right? They're not able to sell it to you. There's no price at which it's affordable to you. And then, like, what do you do, right? And, and 10 years ago or so, there, there's not much you could do, right? Because you just can't, you can't recreate what you could do in hardware and software. But these days, uh, commodity servers and commodity NICs are fast enough to do a lot of uh, useful tasks I in networks. And specifically, if we take a commodity server and put open source software on top of it, then we can look at uh, getting anyone to make us this software or, or even writing it ourselves. And so that's, that's how SNAB came to be, is an effort to distill this pattern into a fresh, usable uh, software that even someone whose main job is not software development could go and start to even implement new RFCs and, and get them deployed in useful ways on their networks. So when I talk about network functions, I just mean something that's on the network. It, it's an abstraction over what could be uh, something you would slot into a rack in the past, but now you can implement using software. And I talk about user space uh, network functions, user space data planes, to mean that the Linux kernel is not involved in processing packets. And what this gives us essentially is speed, uh, speed and customizability. It's hard to get the Linux kernel to change what it does, and it's hard to get really high throughputs out of packet processing in the Linux kernel. Um, and there are a few examples of technologies in this space. This talk is about SNAB, uh, but also most of you all have heard about DPDK, the Data Plane Development Kit, uh, VPP, which is part of the FDIO project, which is oddly pronounced FIDO, apparently. Uh, but we're going to go a bit more into how SNAB is, but the, the fundamentals of this apply also to these other technologies. Whoops. Let's see. Uh, can we go back? Back. Right. So how this works from the operating system's perspective. If you, if you log into the server uh, you're, and you do ifconfig or whatever command that, that, that would show you the interfaces, um, you would see a Linux device associated with your PCI NIC, your, your network card. But for a user space data plane, you tell Linux to forget about the device. You dissociate the kernel driver from that piece of hardware. And then after that, you map the PCI memory range for that device into the address space of the software. 
And at that point, you have memory in your address space, which is directly mapped to the registers on the NIC. So you read the data sheet from the NIC and to figure out what kinds of uh, memory reads and writes corresponding to what kinds of register peaks and pokes it takes to bring up that NIC, right? You effectively write a driver in user space. And that's what DPDK is, mostly. It's a collection of user space drivers uh, for network cards. And SNAP also has drivers as well in it. Uh, at that point, you have your NIC up. You configure it to have a ring buffer where packets are going to be coming in on and a transmit ring buffer. So you have a receive ring buffer and a transmit buffer for you to push packets out on. And then from there, you just program it, right? So you, you get all the packets off of the receive buffer and then do whatever you want to them. And if you send them on, you, you put uh, packets freshly on the transmit buffers. Uh, and that's, that's the essence of what a user space data plane is. Um, the advantages of this approach is that you get the whole packet in software. And so you can do anything with it. There's no question of like what is a fast path and what is a slow path because the fast path is implemented by hardware. And if I stray off of what are the particular capabilities of this hardware and firmware can do, then maybe I'm going to be slower and start dropping packets. No, you have it all in the CPU and you can pro process things uniformly. You, you have a uniform programming model. And additionally, you can use whatever uh, technology you want to program. You can program in Rust. You can program in C. You can program in Lua, which is what we do in SNAP. All of SNAP is implemented in Lua. It's a language that makes small programs. And we use the Lua JIT implementation of Lua, which results in fast programs as well. And finally, you don't have to wait on anybody to provide the functionality that you need. If you need to implement a new extension, a new version of the draft, uh, a new RFC, you can do it yourself, or you can hire one of many people that can work on this kind of software. So it offers a lot of freedom. And if you, at the end you produce open source, as I do, uh, then uh, you have something you can use without any license fees forever. Um, there are some limits to this approach. And I feel like it's, I should be honest and mention them. Uh, one CPU core in a modern server can, pr can process Oh, depending on your workload, maybe up to 40 gigabits or so. On some other workloads, maybe five gigabits, right? You have, it depends on the workload, and you need to keep these things in mind when you're, when you're working on uh, sizing solutions to problems. Um, but there are, you know, you can parallelize with multiple NICs. Usually with one NIC, you have two ports. So already there, you have usually two processes associated with it. You can devote multiple processes to one particular NIC. And in servers these days, you probably have, I don't know, 24, 32, 48 cores. So you can scale out fairly well. It's not, um, it's not the same as having 20, 100 gig ports in a, in a server, right? You, you probably won't reach that bandwidth. But for 20, 10 gig ports, certainly. 40, 10 gig ports, probably also. Uh, so that, that's the kind of size. Uh, solutions we can look at. And I should also mention that um, when you talk to people in industry, this, this work often is mentioned in the same breath as OpenStack or Kubernetes or containerization because people want you to run these in these kind of fabrics that link together with complicated configuration. Um, for me, I don't understand the, compli the, the complexity in these problems. Like, I can't imagine deploying this in anything I have responsibility for. Uh, and, and my users, when I see people running software like this, they run it directly without any virtualization or, or anything else. It's just a program they run on their server. And, and I advise you to think of it like this. And if you need to make the next step to that flexibility which Kubernetes might give you, um, you know, definitely take a look at it then. But that, it's not something you have to buy into in the beginning. OK. So about SNAP, uh, on the SNAP project, uh, we try to write what we call rewritable software, meaning software that if you looked at it, you said, you could say, is that all? You know, I, I could do that in a weekend, right? And the hard part is obviously not typing it out, but searching the space of, of programs, good and bad, to find these uh, small programs that, that suit the use case. So I'm going to show a, a bit of code uh, a bit of concepts in SNAB. These concepts more or less correspond to what you could see in, in VPP, for example. Um, a SNAB program, the network function, consists of apps. 
These apps are linked together in a directional graph. Uh, these directional links are, are called links. And then the SNAB program itself processes packets in units of breadths. And I will go into each of these terms. Uh, so I'm going to start with a simple uh, program. And the uh, code is going to be on the next slide. But just to prepare you for it, it starts where we instantiate a set of apps. And then we're going to follow by looking at declaring the links between them. And then we're going to follow that by a simple busy loop that runs the breaths. So this is the uh, Lua code corresponding to a simple packet filter. Uh, we start by instantiating uh, a, an, an app for the Intel interface. In this case, we're going to use the kind of a standard 82599 interface. And then we instantiate, uh, well, we, we start by importing a couple of modules, the module for the Intel app and the module for um, a filter that takes uh, TCP dump expressions as inputs. We have a compiler for that language that TCP dump implements into very efficient Lua that we, you can then include into your graph. So we begin by making a, a, a graph, which in this slide is called config, because we have many things called config, unfortunately. Anyway, then we, begin, then we follow on by, by actually instantiating the apps. We instantiate the NIC app and the filter app. We link the transmit from the NIC to the input on the filter and the output on the filter to the uh, what to, to the NIC is its receive, which to the world is the transmit. We uh, apply the graph by saying engine.configure, and then we just have a busy loop. Um, and, and you could paste this into a Lua file and run snab that file, and it would run right, right now. Um, as you can see, we specify the NIC by PCI address, not by F0 or what have you, uh, because this really is um, getting the kernel out of the way. And if you did an S trace on this process, an S trace shows you a log of the syscalls, the system calls that a, a process does, you would see nothing. Right? It doesn't talk to the kernel at all. And that's part of how it can keep low latency, how it, how it doesn't drop packets and gets good throughput. So I mentioned we did uh, that SNAB is written in Lua. Uh, the Lua JIT implementation really does, it's kind of our secret sauce here. It lets us. Uh, make expressive systems that run fast. And it's all the way down. It's not just like Lua's configuration with a C library. Everything is in Lua from top to bottom. There are some small bits in assembler, but even those are made from Lua and dynamically. Um, so uh, about breaths. A breath has a couple of phases, just to you know, go a little bit deeper in, into, into these components. We start by pulling some packets into the software system. So you pull them off the receive ring buffer of the NIC. And then you process those packets. You push them through the graph. So to inhale the packets, you run pull functions on the apps that have them. And to process the packets, you run push functions on, on the apps in the graph that have them, according to the, the links that go between them. So this is just an example. This is not something you would have to write yourself. Uh, but this is the pull function for the NIC. As you can see, it's just a loop that says, while there are packets available for me to pull, uh, pull them off and transmit them on my output link. Similarly, this is a push function for the filter app. I pull packets off of the input link of the app. And then if they, I pass it to the, pre, the accept function predicate. Because my, the filter written in the language of TCP dump gets compiled to a function that will return a Boolean. So when I run that function on the packet, it will return true or false. If it returns true, I transmit it on. If it returns false, I free it. So uh, just one more piece of code, and then we're, we can come up for breath. This is what a packet is and what a link is. I don't know, many of you have probably done some programming in the Linux kernel networking stack with the SK buffs, a bunch of uh, linked packet descriptors, a bunch of metadata. That's not what we have here. We literally have just a length marker and the bytes. Similarly, the link is just a ring buffer. Right? So we've really condensed things down to the minimum that we can find um, to try to express network functions in the, in the smallest amount of code possible. And this, this lets you be more agile, change things, write new things, uh, mix, mix up the system. So at this point, 
you know all of the basic concepts in Snap. And you can rewrite it. And I definitely suggest that you do so. Rewrite it in Rust or C or C++ or Scheme or any of these languages. But uh, just like to finish off this talk by discussing a bit of the things that we've built in Snap and that you can use today. So uh, to check out Snap, you just clone the Git repository and make. Uh, and it runs in about a minute. In the early days of Snap, we actually had a code budget. And the whole thing had to build in less than a minute, including the LuaJIT dependency, which is included. Uh, we also had a budget of 10,000 lines, which was very interesting. It forced us to try to make smaller and smaller solutions in code. But now that we're seeing more production use cases, we've gotten a bit more horizontal expansion there. To open up the box here, um, there are a bunch of included apps. Uh, First of all, to get packets in and out of your system, we have drivers written in Lua for a few cards. Uh, notably, the really common cards would be these Intel 82599 cards, along with their uh, siblings, the i210 and the i350. Uh, but the Mellanox Connect X4 and 5 drivers are really nice as well. Um, they can go up to 100 gigabits, but these, these cards are um, not well sized to the PCI uh, device bandwidths. So it's, it's more common to run those cards at 40 gigabits. Uh, in addition, you can talk to the kernel. Anything you can do is take packets in and then shunt packets you don't care about or don't feel like handling back to the kernel using a tap interface. Uh, and you can use SNAB to communicate with virtual machines using uh, vhost and vertio um, interfaces. And of course, pull packets in from PCAP files and save them to PCAP files. We have an, a number of other uh, components that are progressively being fleshed out to implement your standard L2, L3 uh, connectivity bits. And then above that, we have uh, apps, so these reusable uh, nodes in the packet processing graph for IPFIX exporting, uh, for lightweight 4 over 6, the AFTR functionality. It's a, a IP6 transition mechanism for deep packet inspection, filtering, firewall, and, and IPsec, and all kinds of things. Um, right, so there's, there's a set. Uh, I'll have a link to the, there we go. In this lab, slide, we have a link to the documentation down below. I'd also mention that we have, um, one thing we fleshed out recently is a uniform way to configure SNAB applications using Yang. And in this case, literally, the graph of apps is a function of a configuration in terms of a Yang model. Literally a function. You write a function that translates uh, the Yang configuration to the graph of apps, and Snap handles all the rest, including reconfiguration at runtime, uh, query of, of the state of the program's uh, counters, the state, and also its, its configuration, uh, multi-process model where you can devote many workers to one uh, NIC, uh, historical statistics aggregation, including uh, kind of black box functionality where statistics are recorded, recorded into RRD files that you can then go back in for the last couple hours and see when things went wrong. Is it your fault or somebody else's fault? All this sort of thing. So I invite you to take a look at that um, documentation. Um, and, and additionally, besides apps, there's a number of library-like functionality. Functionality you can import, but that doesn't participate in the packet graph as such. So these prefix matching, um, really fast hash tables that support parallel lookups, uh, a number of different compilers and assembly emitters. It's fun stuff. Uh, I would mention that we don't have a full router implementation yet. Uh, and this is in contrast to VPP, for example. If you run a network function based on VPP, it includes as its kind of base graph of apps uh, router functionality uh, to the, the, in, in ways that you expect. Um, and for various reasons, we don't have this yet in SNAP, and it's something we're, we're working on. Uh, and, and we'd love to spend some more time on that. Um, and for more uh, examples of uses, I had a lightning talk a couple days ago, Eight Ways Network Engineers Use SNAP. Uh, definitely go and check that out. I'd like to focus on a couple of ones here to mention. Um, First of all, uh, SNAB is fantastic for prototyping. So if you see a lot of packet flow and you would like to use Scapy to analyze it or Scapy to generate data, but Scapy actually can't deal with the packet rate, SNAB is really like the thing that you need to be using. Um, and I know a, a very large CDN that uses it for exactly this purpose. Um, the, 
it, since we're in uh, this particular audience, I, I'd also like to mention the great experience of uh, an engineer at Switch, the Swiss academic ISP, uh, who wanted a VPN technology that was still in development at that point. It didn't have a finalized RFC, uh, so he just built it himself, and he's deploying it and runs it. It's great. Um, similarly, we have uh, a new IPsec uh, VPN, uh, which has got some interesting capabilities, and, and I think the author, uh, Max Rotenkolber, is, is here if you want to talk about that. Um, and then the largest deployment that we have is an IPv6 transition technology. Uh, there was a talk on this at RIPE 76 by Costa Sorbadellos, the OT engineer, uh, about this one. This is the, the bit that I've been most uh, focused on myself. Um, and it, it has a capability, uh, interestingly being in software, it, it doesn't have very many limits on the scaling of the size of the binding table, which is a set of customers that, that you can support. We've tested out up to 40 million entries, which is pretty large. Um, so, uh, do check us out. Uh, we got the GitHub page. There's also a, a Slack channel that a lot of us are in, and we're not, it's, it's non-denominational. So you can come if you're using MoonGen or if you're using DPDK or, or things like that. We, we talk about lots of topics. There's a join link at the bottom of the GitHub page. And otherwise, I, I have my email and the Twitter right there, and, and happy hacking with Snap. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Andy. Questions? Yeah. Hi, Bengt uh, Gordon from Sw uh, Resilience, Sweden. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's interesting. Uh, how do you cope with uh, uh, the the Intel cards with the multi queue? Is it fully implemented? All the queue handling? I believe that it's f hmm. okay. So. That's a good question. Um, we try not to depend too much on all firmware features because firmware is often buggy. That said, we implement VMDQ filtering based on uh, VLAN and MAC address and additionally support the RSS features of the card. So I, I think that covers the, the standard use cases there. Is that okay. your understanding? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was specifically... Uh, Thinking of uh, DDoS attacks, uh, do, you have, do you separate the control plane and you do you separate the data plane from the multi queue aspect? We do not currently. Yeah. For, for, for better or for worse. Yeah. But I'd like to hear about uh, your experiences in this regard. It seems like you've worked with uh, we had We made some. Uh, we, wrote a we wrote a paper for 10 years ago about. Uh, towards 10 gigabit routing. And uh, we did some, we had to patch the, uh, the kernel drivers for uh, Intel cards to, to actually do that so we, so we could reach the, uh, the card during a DDoS attack. And uh, that was quite interesting, but yeah. That does sound interesting. Oh. I think we, the, the general approach that we, we would like is to scale to handle uh, small packets at high rates. And I know that some systems have more of an overhead for control packets than others. And, and our goal is to reach a, a throughput that we don't have to special case uh, control in that case. That might not be a complete solution, but that's, that's where we're at right now. Okay, thanks. Okay, no more questions? Okay, thank you very much. So before we get to the lightning talk, we have a quick announcement from uh, Peter Van Dyke.